some of them they will maybe they will be scientists they they will be uh, science advocates or so on they will keep safety in mind and that is the overall objective uh, for us to making uh, students as biosafety ambassadors so uh, i'm delighted to share we have now presence in 14 countries and uh, uh, we have uh, so far trained 10000 agriculture students as as biosafety ambassadors and these students they have done phenomenal job in order to to convey this message of safe use to hundreds of thousands of growers that is one part uh, not only students but also when it comes to the agriculture professionals especially the scientists extension officers regulatory authorities so they are also now the part of biosafety ambassador program but now you will be wondering why we are talking uh, about agriculture now with you because we understand in a rural areas when something goes wrong with the uh, with any any of the uh, grower or anyone who who is actually got poisoned because of irresponsible use they first come to you and uh, so they they seek advice from you they need treatment from you and we we have strong belief you are the people who are actually working day and night to protect their health and it's it's a, it's good if we really join hands together so the objective is also to share whatever knowledge information we have regarding crop protection products their prevention as well as cure curative part uh, through our uh, medical experts we will share with you and uh, we expect you to please use this information as much as possible please come back to us with your feedback or we would like to support you by various means by holding these kind of webinars by sharing our medical care database with you uh, and also uh, we'll be training medical students because we also understand medical students they also uh, uh, nowadays uh, because in past there was a case when during mbbs degree they were uh, they were they were taught about all these aspects but nowadays because of so many other things somewhere this topic is is parked somewhere so we would like to then train medical students as well so i think it's a, it's a overall objective is to bring agriculture and medical sector together because these are two noble professions in my mind you know on one side we are growing uh, food for the to to feed people you know the billions of people on the other side our job is also to make sure they are healthy so these two noble professions if they will work together will be ideal for for our society and especially for the growers the poor people who are actually working hard day and night to produce food for us so i will not uh, go too much into details today uh, but uh, uh, I would like to just um, uh, say a few words before I hand it over to Jessica Christiansen. So let me quickly introduce Jessica to all of you. So Jessica is is a head of sustainability and business stewardship at Bayer. So she's graduated with BS, uh, Bachelor of Science uh, in uh, in microbiology, chemistry from USA. She is also MS in environmental science. She also worked in academic institutions for close to ten years. Uh, before working for the industry. She has also uh, worked with Monsanto and now with Bayer. And she's a strong advocate of science and she's dedicated for creating sustainable solution, value creation for all the stakeholders uh, while protecting health of the growers especially and preserving the environment. So with this, I would like Jessica to, to say a few words as opening remarks. And uh, yeah, so over to Jessica. Good. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vinay, for inviting me to join today's webinar and this really important series. I'm extremely excited, as, as Vinay was, was speaking about, it's going to take a lot of partnership um, to, to really provide um, safe use for our growers and our farmers. So for me, the, the team at Bayer, for us to be able to join hands with such prestigious institutions, such as the Kenyatta National Hospital, the Pest Control and Pesticide Board, Agrochemicals Association of Kenya, the Pharmacy and Poisons Board, uh, University of Nairobi, um, you know, to bring this Safe Use Ambassador Program to Kenya is really, really instrumental. This program, as Vinay said, has been rolled out across multiple countries um, already in Asia and Africa with really great responses. It's a, it's a super important critical program. 
the medical sector and the medical professionals are going to add so much to that um, as well. I look forward to much more events such as this one to bring agricultural and our medical professionals together. Uh, it will take this partnership to generally raise the bar of, of crop protection products awareness, responsible use, and at the same time to ensure our farmers um, are, are using safety uh, uh, safely at all times, right? Again, to Vinay's point around the culture that we're really trying to progress with our, with our smallholder farmers in particular. I wish you all uh, a great knowledge exchange. This is going to have a lot of information, hopefully a lot of connections too for everyone. Uh, knowledge sharing is absolutely foundational to these programs uh, across all the partners. So uh, I hope you have a great program. I think it's going to be for four weeks, for the next four weeks. I'm confident that the Safe Use Ambassador uh, Ambassadors uh, would with, with more of us out there, with this program really creating more ambassadors, we are gonna achieve our goal of health for all and hunger from not, for none. Those two things go together, as Manet said for us in a very passionate way at, at Bear Crop Science. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to the real expert that we have in the room today and look forward to, to listening in as well. So I'm going, I'm going to hand it over to, to Dr. Wilfred Steffens. Um, he's our medical toxicology expert uh, here at, at Bear, so he's going to walk us through uh, the discussion today. Thank you very much, everyone. And in part, thank you very much, Jessica. And in particular, thank you all in Kenya for the exciting chance to, to talk to you about one of the topics that is very dear to my heart, which is toxicology. And uh, well, I have been with Bio for more than 31 years, <laughs> for more than 31 years until 2003 doing first occupational medicine, then in addition, environmental medicine. And after that, I was an unpractical physician doing well global medical director organizing and managing for the world the the occupational medicine and clinical toxicology in Bayer. and uh, well i'm retired since a year as you could have guessed but uh, well neither Bayer nor me could let go so i returned for this exciting topic of protection against and treatment of pesticide poisonings I'm a member of the European Association of Poison Control Centers and Clinical Toxicologists of the German Society for Clinical Toxicology and of Medicam, which is an international association of physicians working in chemical industry. Well, in the 31 years at Bayer, I had the chance to learn a lot of things, diagnosis and treatment of chemical accidents, diagnosis and treatment of pesticide incidents. So we built up medical de care database with information on symptoms, on first aid, on treatment of pesticide poisonings. For many years, I took myself the customer and medical professional calls for human and animal incidents with buyer products in Germany, which is now done reasonably enough with a poison control center as in other countries. We started long ago, 10 years ago or so, a program for initial, on initial measures in case there is a pesticide poisoning, as pictorial and with as little text as possible for villages, and a more, somewhat more detailed slide with acronyms for medical professionals. For some time, we were active in supporting the Safe Storage Program, which was mainly in South Asia, in Sri Lanka and India, where the pesticides were locked in boxes for which only the housewife wives had the key, so drunken farmers couldn't easily get at the, at the toxins. And we started about at the same time a snake bite program for Bayer and the leased farms, as did Monsanto in parallel, in particular in, in India. So these were the past activities, and now to the really exciting part. Okay, 
We're in the first session today. You heard that there will be four sessions. Why protect crops? Basics for healthcare professionals or healthcare providers. But let me first say a few words about toxicology. If we read it by the letter, translated by the letter, toxicology is the science of poisons. It started already in the first century common era in Rome, where a Greek physician tried to classify plants based on the therapeutic and their toxic effects. Next was a Muslim, an Arabian scientist who wrote a book on poisons. It's not quite clear whether in the ninth or 10th century common era. In 1360 in India, Kagendra Mani wrote a toxicology, a comprehensive toxicology text. And it's only then that the very famous Paracelsus in the Western, in Western medicine came up with the sentence, all things are poisonous and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes the thing not poisonous. In very short, the dose makes the poison. In 1813, a French scientist wrote the Traité des Poissons, the, to uh, the general toxicology overview. So why to use pesticides? Why not let everything grow as it wants? And well, naturally does. First, we should define a pesticide. A pesticide is a chemical or nowadays also a biological that prevents, destroys, or controls a harmful organism on plants or plant diseases. There are two groups, the plant or crop protection products, which are used primarily in agriculture, and biocides, which are used for non-agricultural purposes. For instance, mosquito eradication in regard of malaria. This is not agricultural, but it's a vital, a vital issue for the world. Why are crop protection products required for crops? for flowers, which is a topic in Kenya, as far as I know, and for forestry. There are insects, mites, ascarids that try to eat the plants we try to grow. There are nematodes that try to eat the root of our crops and fruits. There are plant diseases like fungi, to a lesser degree also bacteria and viruses on the plants. And there are weeds that are growing in crop fields and thus inhibit the, or restrict the room available for the crops. If you look at this red apple, the white rectangle, or the, one, yeah, the white rectangle is what the arable land on the planet. So little, yes, most of the, the earth apple is oceans, but the earth surface, this is the only place for arable land. And this is such a little bit of all of the world that we have. You can also see the yield losses in corn, in, in um, corn crops, row crops, in cotton, in strawberries, in tomatoes that we would have without using herbicides because other plants disturb the growth of the crops. Well, and history shows us that crop protection is indeed required. In Kenya, you are clearly aware of locust plagues. They have been mentioned in the Bible and have occurred in Europe with devastating effects. So even in Europe, even in Germany, in the 9th, 17th and 18th century. Palestine, Lebanon and Syria have been stripped of all vegetation in 1915 by locust swarms, which resulted in a depletion of food supplies and resulting famine. In North Africa, there was a huge outbreak, 86 to 89, spreading over to Arabia, to India, and even to the Caribbean. So the winds blew the locusts over the, over the Atlantic. At the moment, we are again in a locust wave, which again has been reaching India. Yep. Another example for the necessity of crop protection is ergot, commonly called Elm's fire, 
If you look at the photo with the crop grains, there are these black cylinders, which people thought are just dark grains. Actually, it, <coughs> sorry, it's a parasitic fungus in wheat described the, since the third century. And in Limoges in the 10th century, there were 40,000 fatalities from this ergot repeated mass outbreaks in villages and towns. Well, we were in medieval time back then. What did people do against it? They started witch hunts because they were not aware what the cause for this outbreak of diseases possibly could have been. The victims looked like the painting from a famous altar on the right. In more recent times, there was a great famine in Ireland. There was a potato blight, a fungal disease with mass starvation in the middle of the 19th century. In Ireland alone, there were about 1 million fatalities and more than 1 million Irish people fled the island and moved largely to America. Then the next one that we have seen and which was very difficult to treat was the great French wine blight. Tiny insects, so-called grape lice, were imported from North America by mistake, by error. They were in the shiploads or wherever and they devastated more than 40% of French grapes and spread all over Europe. The vineries lost the business, wages were cut by half and this caused immigration to America and Algeria. There was only one chemical solution, soil injection with highly toxic carbon disulfide. The problem in the end could be solved by grafting of American rootstocks as basis for the European vine varieties. We don't want to see anything like that again, but there's another point to this. If you look at the year 2000, the world population was 6.7 billion people. This would have required 4 billion hectares if we didn't have crop protection. With crop protection back then, only 1.5 billion hectares had to be used. In the year 2025, the population will be 8 billion people and we would need nearly 6 billion hectares without crop protection. Do we have 6 billion hectares available? By no means, if we look at the earth, apart from the ocean, so that's only the solid surface of the earth. About a third of it is deserts, glaciers and mountains, no chance to grow anything. 3.8 billion hectares are forests and steppes. 3.4 billion hectares are grassland and prairies. And as said before, 1.5 billion hectares are or have been arable land that really could be used. So this means without crop protection, we would have to give up all the grassland and the prairies and half of the forest and steppes. This can't be the intent. Food supply has become a global challenge. The population rose in the last 70 years from 2.5 to 7.5 billion people. The arable land didn't really grow. We're still at 1.5 billion hectares, which means the farmland per person to feed one person has decreased from 0.5 to 0.2 hectares. And we must use 0.2 hectares to feed a single person of our soon 8 billion people. Even more am amazing, at least in my mind, is the fact that the food we will need in the next 20 to 25 years is twice as much as has been produced in the last 10,000 years. So this will really be a challenge. And well, a challenge that probably cannot be, cannot be met without pesticides. The history of chemical crop crop protection started in antiquity and even before when, when the, the farmers kept smoldering fires to keep insects out of their fields and their acreage. As said in the West, I'm only talking about the West here because I'm not familiar with the Arab world, with the developing world, with the Americas. In medieval times, the, the only means to protect plants, crops were praying and superstition, burning some witches. 
In modern times, first salt, garlic, onion, peppermint extracts were used until today. Kettle extract is used, stinging kettle. In 1800, the first chemicals started to get used, iron vitriol, saltpeter, sulfur, hydrochloric acid, magnesium sulfate. Then in 1861 came the first synthetic insecticide and herbicide, dinitroautocresol. In 1913, the ill-fated and problematic methyl mercury. In 1930, the dithio dithiocarbamates as fungicides. In 83, 89, DDT and the pyrophosphate. In the 40s, early 40s, 2,4-D as a herbicide and the organophosphates as insecticides. Another example, since the 1970s, there is glyphosate. Since the 1990s, there is imidacloprid. Well, if a pesticide is developed, it's not just thrown out of the market. It needs regist registration. And to have this, a lot of studies are required to assure the safety of the product of the active ingredient. This is toxicokinetics, was what does the organism do with the so-called xenobiotic, which in this case is a pesticide. Xenobiotic is foreign to the body. The metabolism, acute toxicity has to be tested for all potential roads of exposure, which are obviously oral, dermal through the skin and inhalation. Skin and eye irritation must be assessed sensitization, the potential to cause allergies, subchronic toxicity in a 90-day study, genotoxicity, chronic toxicity about two years, which is a lifespan in rats, even less in mice, and carcinogenicity. In the last years, also reproductive and developmental toxicity have come into the picture, as have neurotoxicity and endocrine disruption. <clears throat> if this isn't clear enough, further studies can be requested by the registration authorities, for instance, the toxicological mode of action. So the exact attack point of the, or the target point of the active ingredient. That's not all. Pesticides are not sold as active ingredients. They're sold as formulations. So for formulations, again, acute toxicity on all three roads, skin and eye irritation, sensitization, and dermal uptake, dermal absorption, need to be assessed and presented to the registration authorities. So in principle, the regist registration is a double process. If needed, further studies can be required, for instance, on combination effects of active ingredients, so if there are several in the same plant protection product. So how to achieve innovation in research and development of active ingredients? We want to make crop science, pro crop protection products safer for humans and mammals. This can be achieved in two ways, by decreasing the toxicity, searching for and developing less toxic, intrinsically less toxic active ingredients. And we can increase the targeting to mechanism to uh, receptors to enzymes that are in insects or in herbs or in fungi for which we don't have a human a mammalian mechanism. You can see the decreasing toxic toxicity of active ingredients here and as a side note you can see that the three most toxic ones here are natural. Yes, even dioxin is natural because it uh, is, is created even by burning wood, by burning forests. You can see the first insecticides like parathion, DDT, were about as toxic as, well, let's say potassium cyanide. With imidacloprid, this was already reduced to the amount of a coffee cup. And we're talking about a mug of coffee for, for instance, aspirin, for salt, but also for a fungicide, 
And on the right side, you can see water. Yes, you can kill yourself with water if you drink more than actually eight, not even 20 liters. But this is exceedingly hard to do because, well, you will start vomiting. You can keep eight or 20 liters of water in the body. But this amount of water, if really ingested and staying in, the, in a human organism would be fatal. Here you can see how the toxicity of crop protection products has been decreasing. This is a comparison of the toxicity of insecticides to insects and to mammals. For the insects, there is the LD50. For topical application, and here we have for organochlorines, the LD50 for rats and this topical LD50 for insects with a ratio of 91, okay-ish. Carbamates are much more toxic with a factor, safety factor, so to say, of only 16. That is not much. So with carbamates, it has been relatively, well, easy to poison yourself. Organophosphates are also quite toxic with a factor of 33. But if you look at pyrethroids, more modern insecticides available since I think the 80s, there is a factor of 4,500 between what kills an insect and what kills a rat. So the development is more and more to less toxic substances. And this is in part achieved by targeting the crop protection products. There are products like metoprene, which target, which have their effect on juvenile hormone mimics. They distort the ovarian development. And if you treat the pupae of the insects as a higher, higher mortality in adults. Well, this is very insect specific. We have, as humans, you know, we don't have larvae, we don't have pupae. So this mechanism, these juvenile hormones won't affect us. The ketoenols disturb the larval development by distorting insect lipid biosynthesis. The same, we have a different pathway to make, to make our lipids, our fats. So this is again targeted specifically at insects. Then there are chitin synthesis inhibitors like trifluorone. They are insect specific. Okay, also crabs can, for instance, will also have them, but mammals do not synthesize chitin. We don't even synthesize something really related. Even keratin is not very similar to chitin. Thus, new insecticides have a low, sometimes I would try, I would tend to say a very low mammalian toxicity, which is one of the major goals in pesticide development. Receptors are also a very good target for, well, targeting the, the actives to the insects. There are, for instance, the ryanodyne receptors. They have insect specific subtypes which are targeted by the products. Mam mam mammals have other subtypes, number one to three, and these are not affected at all. For the neonicotinyls, there are again insect specific subtypes. subtypes. The insects have alpha 4, beta 2 nicotinic receptors. We as humans have alpha 2, beta 2, and the structure is different. So the neonicotinyls do not that much harm to mammalian and thus human receptors. It's not only the insecticides that are targeted. If we look at herbicides, tubulin is specific in plants. It's different in mammals. And as you see, the majority of herbicides is not present at all in humans. I can't, I don't, won't try to, to really pronounce the EPSP, but all of these are typical in plants and not present in humans. Don't think you can block the chlorophyll synthesis in plants because unfortunately in that case, we have the same mechanism 
except we color it red instead of green because our hemoglobin is made along the same pathway as is the chlorophyll in plants. The only difference is the iron in hemoglobin and magnesium in chlorophyll. So that's not an approach. Very shortly for the interested physicians in the chloroplasts, which obviously are specific for plants because we usually are not green. The targets there will not affect us. The microtubuli, as said, are different, whether they are in the or close to the cell wall or in the nucleus. So all these things are do not really affect mammals and humans. So the photosystem, the unpronounceable ones are in the chloroblasts, tubulins I addressed, and in the endroplasmatic reticulum, there are the fatty acid elongases. For fungicide, the situation is a bit different because, because interestingly enough, fungi are closer to mammals than are plants. So some are unspecific chemical reactives. I started with the wrong one, sorry. The scytolone dehydrotase is not present in humans, but as you see, that is a fraction. Copper sulfate, sulfur, and some other substances used at fungicides are not absorbed in the gastrointestinal tract of humans. And we have a much faster metabolism for steroids. So the steroid C14 demethylase is much faster in us, for instance, in, with a factor of 12,000 12, for the azole fungicides. Even this gives room enough for targeting the active ingredients to insect, plant, or fungus-specific targets. As said, we wouldn't start to bring out active ingredients to the fields, not even sell them to the farmers, not even sell them to the dealers. What is sold are formulations, the so-called products. What is a formulation? According to a, well, somewhat aged definition, but there is no, no newer or better one, a pesticide formulation is a mixture of chemicals which effectively controls pests. And formulation, a pe formulating a pesticide means you have to process it, to add other things to it, to improve storage, handling, safety, application, and effectiveness. So there will be the active ingredients and there may in rare cases synergists that and the synergist will enhance the effect of active ingredients. To my knowledge, Kenya is a large exporter of pyrethrum and pyrethrum flowers from which the natural pyrethroids, the pyrethrines are made. And well, these are not as strong, not as effective as the synthetic pyrethroids. So in some cases, piponyl butoxide is in such products as a synergist and effect enhancer. Solvents used to be what the word says, solvents, toxic one like N-hexane, like xylene, like N-methylpyridine. Today, they can be plant oils, but mostly the solvent today in pesticide products is water. There may also be carriers, liquid or sol solid chemicals that support the delivery of the active ingredient to the plants. Adjuvants like surfactants, which flatten and spread the droplets on the leaves. So the surface in contact is much larger than, one, than the one touched by a droplet. Also, these reduce the dr also drift reducers can be in foaming reducers, which is important during mixing. If you stir the solution of the formulation in water, you don't want a lot of foam in the product. And as we don't have the, the solvents that much more anymore in the products, we need at very, very low doses preservatives for the conservation of the product. 
Most commonly, as the ag agronomists among you will know, are mixed in water and sprayed. However, quite often active ingredients are not water soluble. That's when all these formulation tricks and there are really research laboratories and development facilities in the companies which formulate the active ingredient into a product with optimal properties. These would be safe, 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 and convenient use. A type of application and specifics of the active ingredient adapted to the intended use. The storage stability, you don't want to, well, to decay or to rot a pesticide formulation on the shelf. The required dose must be delivered to the site of action of the insect or the plant. Sometimes this means the plants have to eat leaves in which the pesticide is present, in, not on. Reliable mixing and application of product under various climatic conditions. So if we sell the pesticide in, well, let's say in Canada, the conditions certainly are different to a tropic climate, like I suppose largely in Kenya, except for the South, I think. And or in India, Thailand, with their A hot and B humid climate. Examples for formulations. We used to have lots and lots of emulsifiable concentrates, EC, active ingredients in sulfon and solvents with an addition of surfactants. They make or they are a spontaneous emulsion of oil and water for spraying then. And the emulsion droplets are very small, 0.1 to 1 micrometer. Easy to manufacture, high biological activity, good chemical stability, but solvents. So today we have suspension concentrates. This is the, in principle, or basically insoluble active ingredient in aqueous phase with all the things mentioned, carrier surfactants. The benefits, they are safe and convenient as they're water-based. They, there is no dust and there are no flammable liquids anymore as with the solvents. Then there are nowadays, very modern, the ODs. This is a dispersion of solid active ingredients in oil. This could have been paraffinic or aromatic solvents, but today it's vegetable oils or methylated seeds oil like rapeseed oil, biodiesel in principle. They're water-free and in the spray tank, the oil is emulsified and the solids are dispersed. The oil is an adjuvant, which means that the substance remains longer on the leaves. The spray retention, as this is called, is higher. So not that easy for rain to wash it off. And in themselves, they need no added preservatives, which is an advantage again. There are wettable powders, then the active ingredient is present as a powder, plus surfactants and other things which make it a solid suspension in water. You have a uniform active ingredient distribution, very good control of residues. The dermal hazard is low, but the fine powder is dust. So we're talking about a dust problem here. There are also water dispensable granules, which are not that much of a problem because they cause little or no dust, but disperse quickly in water. And then you have a suspension of fine particles as with the wettable powder in water. Reduced inhalation risk, high load of active ingredients is possible. There are many, many further formulation types. So we, we could make a whole session only for formulation types, but I don't think that's any benefit. You can have dusts, granules, microemulsions, capsules in suspension, soluble powders, aerosol sprays, like for instance, for household insecticides, or baits like for, for rats and cockroaches. Well, if there is a poisoning, 
everybody, including me, formally, are thinking only of the active ingredient as the culprit. I can only warn against that. In many products, the active ingredient is in very, very low concentrations. And there are other things in older products, for instance, solvents, that, that are in far higher concentrations. And they, this must always be kept in mind. These incipients in the formulation can be more important than the active ingredient. An example, sol solvents in old emulsifiable concentrates that could have been xylene, kerosene, acetone. And you can see nausea, vomiting, dizziness, somnolence, even coma and sensitization against catecholamines from ingestion or even in houses inhalation of these products. And these can and will dominate the signs and symptoms. I remember an issue with the change of solvent formulation in a spray formulation, so spray can formulation, which caused an unusual increase in nausea, um, dizziness, and tiredness and headaches. Well, this did not fit at all to the active ingredients present in that formulations. And on the other hand, there were not the typical symptoms to be expected from the active ingredients. And after a change of the solvents in the formulation, the product was gone. Nowadays, we have the issue of surfactants that may allegedly have effects on cell membranes and thus cause cerebral or cardiac symptoms. However, surfactants are all around us in a multitude of products. There are surfactants in wall paints, in printer inks, in shampoos, in toothpastes, in detergents, in toilet bowl cleaners. Well, actually surfactants are all around us. I'm not saying that they are definitely harmless in crop protection products. This is an open question, but it's not always the active ingredient that will cause trouble. So I'm a bit faster than I expected, obviously. Here are some important contacts for your country. The pharmacy and poison sport, the pest control product sport, and the Agrochemical Association of Kenya. And let me mention urgently, also the Biosafe Use Ambassador Facebook page, site, whatever it's called on Facebook, I'm too old. <laughs> um, try to find it, Biosafe Use Ambassador and Facebook. There are about thousand members already and we would love to have more. That's also an exchange platform where you can ask questions, which will then be answered to the best of our knowledge. With this, I thank you for your attention and a big thank you to Kenyatta National Hospital to make this presentation, to make this event possible. I'm looking forward for further cooperation and the next three uh, lectures that will come. And as far as I can say, now the floor is open for questions and answers. Back to you, Dorothy. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stevens. I hope I'm audible enough. But uh, thank you for that overview. And I'm seeing also quite a number of comments appreciating the presentation. Uh, thank you for the well articulated presentation. So there are some questions in the Q&A session. And um, I'm glad to see that we also have representation from Agrochemical Association of Kenya. And I'm hoping we also have uh, representation from uh, TIS of the Toxicology Society of Kenya. I think I'll ask the side chance that uh, if there are questions that they can be able to help to answer, they can do the same. I see there is uh, Silvanas Wagwire of CROP. Um, think of Agrochemical society but can you be able to see the questions on the Q&A section? Well I'm trying to get some help with that. <laughs> okay so as uh, you get that I hope here you can assist to be able to see those view those questions. There is uh, Dr. Vagela. You can see the Q&A? Yeah I can see them now. 
So if you could be able to respond with the questions starting yeah. from Dr. Well, in this presentation, thank you, Dr. Vagela. In this presentation today, the intent is only to give an overview. We'll come to the different groups and some types and also to round up um, in the next, in one of the next presentations, probably in the third one. Yes, uh, organic. Sounds good, but personally, I have my doubts that this will will work in a frame that we need for the future. When when you look at the um, at the options we have, and for instance, we all we just are losing all of Ukraine for farming. I'm afraid. So the situation is getting worse and worse. In India, we have uh, this this extreme heat at the moment, which well makes everybody long for monsoon, but this will be June until that will come. Next question by Luke Musa Musau. I, I just have to read it, give me a moment. Well, the first two parts, uh, the first two parts of the question, as I can only speak for bio, obviously, I cannot speak for other companies in particular, I cannot speak for um, generic companies in Asia, we even had a situation here that banned chemicals were imported into Europe from there, it was methyl parathine back then long since banned in, in Europe, but it came into one European country directly from Asia. So for Bayer, what I can say is we only sell pesticides also in Africa, Asia and South America that have a full registration in at least one OECD country. So if we don't have that, we are not selling the pesticide. Well, the prices are high or are thought to be high. The, the process of development is as with medicine, nearly as with medicines, a very long and painstaking one. So if you find a substance now that is working, and does everything that it should, it still has to go a long way. So it has to pass not only all the medical studies that I've shown you, it has also to pass environmental studies, residue studies in different crops, in all kinds of animals. So it's a long, long way. And in the end, only two of thousand substances examined can only make it to the market. Also, some agrochemicals are for specific purposes. For instance, there are active ingredients that are targeted at rice production. You don't need them anywhere else. So nobody would ever attempt a registration in Germany for a rice herbicide, for instance, or a rice insecticide. And then residues tend to be higher in your flour exports. Yeah, well, this, this goes into the area that, that Vinay has been touching. We, we have to make the, the users understand what is the recommended dose. As, as you rightfully said, all right, it shouldn't be diluted. There should be the effective concentration, but there should, should not be more than the effective concentration. So even roses from Kenya should be treated in a way that the concentration is not too high, the use concentration, and then there is the defined time after application until they are harvested and sold, because it takes some time for, for the active ingredients and the other parts of the formulation to, to decay, to be destroyed, to go under a um, well reasonable level. 
Hope this answers your question, Luke. To take a breath and just look through some of the questions, I want to uh, request uh, Benson Kiki of Crop Life. He can, if he can be able to make a comment on uh, on the question that was asked about uh, uh, about uh, the chemicals and the pricing of uh, chemicals, maybe you can uh, uh, put a thought with regards to that. So, uh, Benson, are you able to? I think you should be able to talk. Yeah, thanks. Benson? Yeah, I'm trying to trace the question so that I can uh, on the question board. Uh, maybe if it can be reposted, I can uh, attempt to answer that. Okay, as I share that, uh, you, but the question was basically was uh, asking regarding the why the prices are so high. I appreciate that Stephen can only answer for there, but as is um, is asking about why are the prices so high, and so then that makes our farmers end up diluting. Uh, Improperly, and thirdly, chemical residues tend to be high in horticulture. I think that has been answered. But why are the prices so high? If you could uh, respond to that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think that is a, a fairly direct uh, question. Uh, the pricing of products uh, is the can call it a, a science as well, because it has to take into consideration the research and development component of the, of the particular product. And uh, you, you are, maybe for, the, for those who are not aware, the research and development process can take upwards of 11, up to 15 years for a, a viable product to come into the market. So that investment uh, has to be recouped uh, with a favorable pricing policy. And uh, when, the market, when the product comes to the market, it is most of the time usually fairly uh, priced uh, as far as the research and development process is concerned. I'm sure most of the medical personnel will uh, be able to uh, get the difference between generic products and uh, R&D products. Uh, despite that, there is the factor that is uh, taxes, and uh, they also play a key role, uh, especially when you do some comparisons over the region. Our taxing regime is probably a bit more higher, and that will play a role in the, in, in the price of, of a particular product. I guess that is uh, as far as I can comment on the pricing in the Kenyan market. Thank you. Thank you, Benson. So, Wilfred, if you looked at some of the questions and you can be able to respond. Yeah. As I share some with her, related more or less to the Kenyan market to Benson. Thank you. Okay, the next one is the risk of prostate cancer. Um, the largest study that is ongoing on um, pesticides and cancer is over decades the Agricultural Health Study in the United States and there and also from other publications, I'm not aware of a really significantly increased risk of prostate cancer. Next question, what is hydroponic? Sorry. Oh, okay, okay, understood, thank you, yeah. Well, these are the same nutrients, the same fertilizers which are brought into the soil. And so they shouldn't, they are not dangerous. Yeah, the next question by Irene Kamanja is a very interesting one that has kept me busy for many years too. Yes, animals also get poisoned by pesticides. Um, especially dogs are at risk because they first eat and then think. Cats think very long and then eat. But uh, there are lots and lots of poison dogs, but also cattle, sheep, all these animals can get poisoned by pesticides. Um, in, in my case, I decided, um, well, I don't care how many legs the patient has. And then do my best to also 
respond to, to inquiries about animals. It's the same with uh, the poison control centers. And indeed there are in the background veterinarians there, which um, can advise on how much of what to give against a poison. But Silvanos wants to answer. Uh, thanks, it's uh, Benson uh, once again. Mm. I'm using a separate link. Uh, real ah, okay. But, uh, Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe I can also chip in on that uh, on that aspect of uh, veterinary products and uh, cases of animal poisoning, especially with respect to acaricides on animals and herbicides on pasture. Uh, the Kenya Veterinary Board, which licenses the veterinary and para veterinary professionals, we have. Uh, and a, a close collaboration with them, whereby they have what are known as continuous professional development points, you know, uh, commonly known as CPD points. So we work with them a lot uh, in the regions whereby we have people who are able to train them on the responsible and safe use of pesticides. So as to avoid uh, poisoning from either uh, wrong usage or over, overdosing of certain products and also the steps to take when uh, pasture has been sprayed with uh, herbicides. So it's a continuous process of uh, awareness creation among the professionals who can then cascade the information to the farmers. As AK also, when we meet uh, with farmers who are practicing both crop and livestock farming, we try and emphasize the need for use of appropriate equipment to separate what is being used on the animals and what is being used on the crops, as well as the withdrawal periods that are, should be observed when they use herbicides in areas where the, the animals are likely to graze. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I can only, only support this. Plus, the acaricides will usually be on the skin of cattle, for instance, and are not intended to, to really penetrate the skin. And well, herbicides on pasture, well, there, sh there shouldn't be fresh herbicides on pasture. Um, in the wider world, pest control was organic. Yes, indeed. I showed you in one of the slides that with the traditional methods, we would have needed already in 2000 more than triple as much arable land as we did you actually with the pesticides. So yeah, it's a question, but it will be significantly difficult um, to, well, to, to use only organics. The further research in this area is more going into the direction of biologics using bacteria or fungi that attack fungi, for instance, or that will also kill insects. Um, there are progress, and I showed you in several of the slides that the pesticide products and the active ingredients are by intent less and less toxic. So Bayer has not been selling WHO1A1B, so the highly toxic organophosphate products anymore since more, far more than 10 years. Um, so I think we're already on a good way thinking about targeted um, mechanisms and less toxic pesticides. Over to Dorothy. Oh. Thank you, thank you. Time to digest. Uh, I hope uh, Benson has seen some of the questions I've directed to him as he looks at them. Uh, Masi, there is a question here. Masi Naraza is with the Toxicology Society of Kenya. Um, uh, I'd like her to respond to this uh, question, uh, this uh, message. Uh, regarding how do we help reduce the sweet, how best can we control use of pesticides so that we can reduce side cases by use of the same. Uh, Marcia, I think you're with toxic PSOC, the Toxicology Society. You can look at that as uh, Benson looks at some of the questions that uh, were directed regarding the local scenario. Okay, thank you. Well, supermarkets compared to locally available, that depends, as both Benson and me said, how the farmers are using 
the, the pesticide formulations, the products, the crop protection products. There can be overdosages in both cases. There can be too many spray sessions in both cases. Well, if you have a very large farmer, you, you must remember farming in the world goes from the small hold farmer with, well, a very small patch of land where he's growing a little more than he and his family need to sell that and make a living to, to huge farms like in the USA or even larger in Russia and everywhere. And that's why we're doing these, these uh, Safe Use Ambassador Program we must make clear, do as much as needed and as little as ever possible. So this question is not that, that easy to answer, unfortunately. Um, yes, I used, what, uh, I used everything online. Oh, what a nice question. I would love to, I would love to invent one, a universal antidote for first aid for all pesticides. But unfortunately, that's not possible. They all have a different mechanism of action. And um, it's, it's spoiler alarm if I continue now, but uh, I will speak about general measures in the, in the next session. So next Wednesday, um, talking about things like induced vomiting, gastric lavage, things like that. But there is no universal antidote. There is something that seems to be regarded as a universal antidote, and that's milk. Please do not give milk in case of pesticide poisoning. Milk contains fat, and that will improve the uptake of fat-soluble substances. And I said that most active ingredients are not water-soluble, which means they're probably lipophilic, and then you would transport more of them into the organism. Arable land in hectares, what is the percentage? Difficult to say. The numbers that, that I found available were, were only in hectares. Um, I think there was a slide how much, Arab, how much solid land we have on the planet. And I'm not sure about the surface of the world, but you have to, to distract the, the oceans and the ice shields anyhow. Yeah, Irene, you're welcome. Okay, as you read that question, I have to ask uh, Masi, is there anything that uh, either as uh, the toxicology society that, are, that are, they're doing to be able to reduce the use of pesticides uh, uh, in, in suicide. I think that's a question that has been a comment. How best can we control the use of pesticides so that we can reduce suicide cases? I believe we are looking at uh, safe use so that we can reduce the risk of poisoning. So there's a question from Wikani, how best to control pesticide use to reduce suicide cases. Are you able to respond to that? Uh, Wilfried or myself? I was hoping Marcy can respond. Uh, no, is that the pesticide in Kenya, Hello. okay, we seem to have. Uh, I think your connection may not be very clear. We are losing you. Maybe you could put on the chat. We are losing you, but I don't know whether Benson, you have a comment on that because we're not getting Massey very clearly. Okay, as maybe as we await uh, Massey's response, there's a, maybe a comment, there's a, a comment I can make on the same. Uh, the products as is obvious are not meant for such a purpose. And this is one of the areas of abuse that is uh, reported. Thankfully, it is less common nowadays uh, as compared maybe to previously when 
most of the end users were not well educated on pesticides. And uh, I'm glad to see that from the poison information service, the cases of uh, intentional poisoning uh, have gradually gone down over the years. Uh, what has been done is that, uh, uh, as uh, Wilfried has explained in terms of the toxicity, uh, as uh, indicated by the LD50, the ones that have a very low, uh, that have high toxicity are actually restricted by the Pest Control Products Board and they have a, what is known as a red color band. Uh, when you look at the products, the pest control products, they will have either a red color band to indicate very high toxicity or a green one to indicate uh, that under circumstances of normal use, they would normally not have uh, any negative effect on the user. In between, there's a yellow and then there's the blue in a decreasing order of toxicity. So when you go to your no, uh, common agrovet, you will find that you will fairly, you will rarely find products with the red color band, which are the most toxic. Uh, Pest Control Products Board have done their best to restrict the access to these products, and they are mostly sold to only uh, licensed pest control operators or farms whereby uh, they are known to directly use them and uh, are registered for that purpose. So nowadays it is a bit more difficult to find uh, red color bands uh, or high toxicity products over the counter. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, next question, Dr. Vananda Shiva. Well, I will like to look into that. I'm, I'm not aware so far that organic, fa organic farming really can, can help avoid pesticides. Anyhow, what we call in Germany biofarming doesn't work without pesticides, without chemicals, without artificial products either. So at least it's copper salts and sulfur in that. And uh, yeah, the insects, bees are under discussion everywhere. I'm aware of that. So well, this is one part of the targeting of, of pesticides and again of the correct use. I've shown. Well, then the anonymous questions, who is in charge of teaching? Oops. That's okay. It's not your excess quantities of PPP. Yes, we we've addressed this for in, in, for several questions already, and as you said, as you heard, we are trying our best to educate the growers about the correct use. I think it's human to think using much is helping much. But that, like for medicines, is not true for pesticides either. So we are trying to do this. And I assume that also governmental organizations are doing this in the respective countries. Regarding the question by Dr. Tertus Sisenda. Long-term long effects of spraying pesticides on farm soil and humans. Um, there are institutions that said residual values or acceptable daily intake values for pesticides, which have safety factors to the lowest observed effect, no, to, sorry, to the no observed effect level of at least 100 in some cases, for instance, for babies, uh, of 10,000. So um, as far as we know from these continuous examinations, there are no long-term effects, but uh, predictions are always difficult in, in particular if they relate to the future. So uh, the current status is that there are no effects and many of the pesticides have been used for decades already without seeing, seeing um, significant things. I like to 
point to the agricultural health study in the USA as the largest one addressing all these, these questions. Yes, Simon, welcome. Well, okay. yeah, sorry. Sorry, uh, I don't know that it was Benson going to talk. I was going to give, I was looking for somebody from the TSOC to be able to make a comment. I see Dr. Yale is online and uh, those are questions regarding what uh, what is being done collaboratively, I think it was in the chat, with the Poisons Board and the Agrochemical Association. So if you could be able to give a comment to what is being done in terms of working together and handling the issues of uh, poisoning. Cases, especially with uh, with uh, uh, pesticides. But uh, as we said, other comments and uh, be able to give a summary response. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dorothy. I hope I can be heard. Yes. Okay. Maybe on behalf of the Toxicology Society of Kenya. Uh, we are working collaboratively with the Agrochemical Society of Kenya and other agency, Kenya Academy of Sciences. Uh, and uh, we are looking at developing, collaboratively developing poison centers in each and every county and uh, having proper dissemination of information by use of the extension officers within the counties. So the talk has started uh, actually about a week ago. We were somewhere developing such guidelines, working with the Pharmacy and Persons Board. And uh, through that, uh, uh, we are able to disseminate that information. And, and maybe we will work with the MOH, but through the Pharmacy and Persons Board as a leading uh, agency in developing this poison center. So uh, we are working, we are working to ensure that uh, this poisoning uh, or the issues uh, uh, are managed in our country. Uh, so it's work in progress. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank, thank you, Dr. Yale. Um, what can you say about activated charcoal? Yes, for, for some things, um, there is activated charcoal as, uh, well, not an antidote, but as a primary measure of gastrointestinal decontamination. I wouldn't give it in all cases. In, in many cases, it's not required. If there is vomiting, there's a risk of aspiration of charcoal particles in the lung with the vomiting. But we'll come to this when we're talking about the different uh, about the different groups or the different types of pesticides. Yes, Dr. Karaoke, I agree. Highly toxic substances that would, as medications, require a prescription. I think Benson was it told us that they have a red band and can only be used by licensed professionals. This is something that cannot be supported enough. So one of the tricks Bayer is following is to try to establish well, professional sprayers, which offer their services to farmers, and then the group needed to be trained and observed also for correct behavior would be smaller than it is now. But I agree, if there are still highly toxic um, pesticides, there, there indeed should be a regulation to, to make them, and if it's only by packaging, different from the, the less hazardous pesticides. Ah, yes, the PPE question. Very, very good question, which is keeping us busy at Bayer also. We don't have only the Safe Use Ambassador Program. We have a really huge program for safe use trainings, which involves, I think, with over a million participants per year, which also involves the correct use of PPE. I'm fully aware that in Kenya, it's practically impossible to put a farmer into a Tyvek suit, maybe even with a respirator and rubber gloves. It's, it's impossible. So the PPE recommended must be targeted at the circumstances. What is good in cool Germany definitely will not be good in 
hot Kenya, in hot and humid Thailand. So we need to have training. And PPE, well, it would be a good idea if the pesticide dealers also sell affordable PPE. Um, that, that would, in a moment I have to move the screen. This black field is blocking my view. Yeah, the problem is that there are no immediate effects. If they were irritating, the farmers would use them. This, this is why we try to train now also the medical professionals to inform them, to make them able to spread the news, to, to act as multiplicators and tell the farmers, well, there may be effects that you don't notice at the very beginning. Um, so, yeah. The PPE is a big topic that must be addressed from all sides, from the companies, from industry associations, and also from regulation authorities and governmental in institutions. But it must definitely be targeted at the country. Okay, that's all I see so far. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Wilfred, for taking a good that session. And thank you also for the other panelists. I know I, I ambushed you to be able to respond, but thank you so much for your valuable contribution. Now, I had mentioned at the beginning that this would be a four-part series. So next Wednesday, we'll be able to go through how not to get poisoned. And then now, the, 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 on the 18th of May, we have the poison treatment toolbox. Uh, so I to thank you now. Uh, the next, um, with regards to CPD, we also have a conference that uh, the Ray conference that we encourage you to also consider participating in, and I think we'll send you'll be able to get that information on the on the link. And for those who might have joined the session a bit later than. A bit later, then we are encouraging you, you can watch this session. It, uh, you'll be able to access it from the KNH website. You give us some um, four days. Okay, and then just to let you know, for those who have been following us uh, routinely, the HIV series for tomorrow has been rescheduled to next week, Thursday. So we will have uh, a different session tomorrow. But we want uh, to encourage you. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, the Safe Use Ambassador Program, for just being able to work with us. We want to uh, actually work with many partners to make sure that we actually have a poison center that is active and reachable uh, and they can be a, a center of excellence as we move forward. So thank you so much, Wilfred, uh, Pia, Vine, and Jessica for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Yale and uh, uh, Benson, who are panelists uh, today as well. And uh, I want to believe that that is getting to the end. We're just six minutes to the close. So I want to hope that if there are questions that you had that were not answered, you can just raise them uh, next week when we're having the session again and make sure that we can have them all answered. Any last comment? I, I want to give uh, Pia an opportunity. Does you have, you have any comment you want to make as we end the session? No, she's shaking her head and smiling <laughs> happily. <laughs> okay. Let, let me just ask, uh, answer the last question. Yes, the containers yes. are durable. That's the intent because we don't want leakages. Um, reuse can be indeed very hazardous. And so in my next presentation, I will recommend to puncture used canisters so that they cannot be abused for water or other drinkable fluids. Dr. Benson, you want to say something on this too? Uh, thanks, Wilfried. It's uh, just Benson, but thanks for the honor of the doctor title. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, <laughs> yes, uh, at AAK, we have a program known as the Empty Pesticide Container Management Program. And uh, its main objective is to create awareness among the end users of 
plant protection products that uh, they should triple rinse their empty containers and uh, puncture them and then deliver them to the nearest uh, collection center in their locality. It is spreading across the country. Currently, we are in over 16 counties that have, have high agricultural potential. So by next year, we are hoping to have ca countrywide coverage uh, whereby all farmers will have access to a collection center where they can deliver their used containers. Mm, right. It is highly discouraged, the, the, the use of, uh, of, of the empty pesticide containers. And as, as, as Wilfried has said, it, they, are, they are made to be studied so that they, they, there's no spillage during transportation or during storage. Uh, for those in the rift, rift section, Bomet, Narok, Nakuru, Wasingishu, I think you've seen some of the farmers using the 20 liter containers for milk deliveries. And uh, I think we are open to suggestions on how we can, we can be able to reach out to these farmers. If you know of any organizations that are dealing with uh, food safety and health, we can be able to partner and see how we can reach out to these farmers and give them either virgin plastic containers or even aluminum containers, as we also educate them on the dangers of using, uh, of reusing the pesticide containers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, then, yeah, suggestion for a TV or radio session that must be discussed with biocommunications. I can't say anything on that. Um, I thank you from my side also very, very much for the interest, for the interesting discussion, which was a pleasure to see that you're so engaged. And uh, while I was a bit nervous before the first presentation, I now indeed look forward to the next three ones. Thank you very much. And until next week. Thank you much. And for those who are asking about the slides, we send, uh, we encourage you instead, if you want to watch this material again, then you can be able to get to the KNH website and you'll see the webinar link. You can access the material. We don't routinely send slides of the presentation. Instead, we encourage you to just follow the session again. But otherwise, thank you very much for your time and we look forward to seeing you next week for this same uh, pesticide safe use ambassador program series and uh, tomorrow for the other uh, the other webinar events so thank you very much for those who joined us and uh, we really appreciate the compliments and we appreciate you uh, noting that uh, appreciating that we've taken a change in terms of the topic uh, for this uh, month and uh, there was also a question about somebody asking about how to to join the Agrochemical Association and to hope uh, Benson has put that link there. But if not, he will share it to the KNH uh, email and we can be able to post put that up when we are sending the notice about this meeting. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, I, uh, sorry to interrupt. Maybe on, on that front, they can visit the AAK website at agrochem.co.ke. It has all the information on membership. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I think we are right at 3.30, so uh, I am not too sure what this comment is. Okay, but we are back at, we are at 3.30, and that's the, the closing time for our session. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you on this pesticides management series next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.